Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Steve Iadarola, Jeffrey Zilks, and Michael Bullock. Coming up on DTNS, Dr. Kiki is here to talk brain-computer interfaces. What are they really, and who are they for? Plus, NVIDIA's got new GPUs, and AI art is becoming normal. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 20th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, the host of This Week in Science, Dr. Kiki. Joining from Portland, Oregon. How's it going over there in Portland, Oregon? Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Weather is good in the fall. We haven't yet hit the depressing rainy time of Ah, year. Ah, which is the rest of the year until summer. (laughs) Which which is the rest of the year. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Well, folks, the Windows 11 version 22H2 update, a.k.a. the 2022 update, is now available if Microsoft says your machine is eligible, which it hasn't said mine is. So while I wait for that to happen, let's talk about a few tech things you should know. Amazon sent out an invite to a virtual event taking place on September 28th. Company didn't give details on what it will announce, only saying it would involve devices, features, and services, <laughs> which means it could be pretty much anything. Last year at this time, Amazon announced the new Echo and Ring devices, as well as the Halo View fitness tracker and the always home cam drone. So, again, could be anything. Yeah, it's going to be stuff like that, though. <laughs> Devices, features, and services. Amazing. Uh, AMD says it'll launch its Radeon RX 7020 series of GPUs in Q4. That's Those are the ones that are in the $400 to $700 price range. Uh, Lenovo's IdeaPad 1, Acer's Aspire 3, a 17-inch laptop from HP are all going to have one of those 7020 series cards inside. The 7020 series is based on AMD. AMD's RDNA 2 architecture. Uh, We will get more 7000 series GPUs on the way later, one would suspect, because AMD Radeon SVP and GM Scott Herkelman tweeted Tuesday morning that AMD will launch RDNA 3, that's one more than two, uh, on November 3rd. Mozilla researchers say that by parsing video recommendations data from more than 20,000 YouTube users, buttons like not interested, dislike, stop recommending this channel, and remove from watch history are mostly ineffective when the goal is to stop similar content from being recommended. Mozilla called on volunteers who used its Regrets Reporter, a browser extension that overlays a general stop recommending button to YouTube videos viewed by participants. U.S. grocery store chain Wegmans is discontinuing... It's self-checkout mobile app. Remember, we were talking about Instacart doing the mobile app uh, that could let grocery stores do that. Wegmans was not using the Instacart one, uh, but it's no longer going to use the one that it was using. Uh, Wegner's scan, I'm sorry, Wegmans scan let you scan each item you put in your cart then scan a barcode at the self-checkout register to get your total amount and pay. Wegmans said in an email to customers that, quote, unfortunately, the losses we are experiencing prevent us from continuing to make it available in its current state. So people were just forgetting to scan everything that was in their cart. Sad. Very sad. Apple will increase app store prices across Europe and some Asian markets beginning October 5th. Also probably sad for some folks. Affecting both regular apps and also in app purchases. In Japan, there'll be more than a 30% hike, while countries using the euro will see a 20% hike. Other countries affected include Sweden, Chile, Egypt, Malaysia, Pakistan, Vietnam, and South Korea. Developers can change the price of their apps and in-app purchases, including auto-renewable subscriptions, if they apply, at any time, but the minimum price will now be lower. For example, in the Eurozone, the minimum charge of 99 cents was raised to 119 euro. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, and you can still do free. They have they haven't increased the price of free. Right, yeah. Like you don't have to charge. <laughs> right. But if you do, 
you, you have some restrictions now. <laughs> All right, let's talk about these NVIDIA announcements. NVIDIA officially announced its 4,000 series of GPUs, uh, or the 40 series. You might hear it called that, too. Uh, this is the one based on the Ada Lovelace architecture, named after Ada Lovelace. The RTX 4090 will arrive October 12th for $1,599. That's the top of the line. Uh, then there's the RTX 4080. That'll come later in November for $899. The 4090 is going to ship with 24 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory, enough to make you drool. I mean, enough to claim it is two to four times faster than the 3090 Ti at the same power consumption. NVIDIA recommends that you do get enough power, a uh, PC power supply of at least 850 watts when using a Ryzen 5900X class processor is what they recommend. Uh, the RTX 4080 will come in 12 gigabytes and 16 gigabyte models. Those are both also GDDR6X. Uh, the 12 gigabyte model will be $899. The 16 gigabyte 4080, $1,199. All three of these cards include updated shadow play support. Uh, they can capture 8K video at 60 frame per seconds in HDR. They support hardware AV1 encoding. And the 4000 series is going to support PCIe Gen 5 16 pin connectors without the need for a custom solution as required in the previous gen. Cards will also include an adapter to connect with three standard eight pin power connectors as a nice option. Power supplies are coming in October from Asus, Cooler Master, FSP, Gigabyte, iBuy Power, MSI, and Thermaltake. Uh, you can expect to see RTX 30 series still on the shelves, though, because NVIDIA has said it made too many of those. You might see those at a discount. Uh, the 4090 and the 16 gigabyte 4080 are also going to come as founders editions from NVIDIA, as you might expect. Uh, Roger, what do you make uh, of the new line? We've, we, we've got the brand new top of the line NVIDIAs now. How do they look to you? They look very impressive. I mean, we won't know until actual you know third party benchmarks come out, but it really looks like NVIDIA has decided to go all in with the ray tracing to the point that they're not just improving it, but they're they're... They're advancing it with new uh, with new features, uh, including demosaicing as as well as uh, improvements to D, uh, DLSS uh, to essentially to, to give you all the added visual benefits. What's what's interesting is the price points that they come in now. Is I mean they're really not targeting your average gamer anymore. They're 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 looking to to kind of go the next step up, whether it's a Twitch streamer who does gaming but wants to make sure they put out at least a 4K stream uh, to their audience or, you know, uh, at-home creators uh, who might have other uses for all that, you know, GPU horsepower. I mean, it's important. It's a very impressive, but I will also add it's a little too rich for my blood at that price point. Yeah. And and it may not be even targeting those people. Maybe that's just what they have to charge. And so that's the market they're going to have to go for. Well, speaking of announcements, NVIDIA also announced a processor for autonomous vehicles called Drive Thor, based on NVIDIA's Hopper GPU platform that's optimized for processing algorithms at two quadrillion operations per second. That's eight times NVIDIA's Orin processor. And with 77 billion transistors, Hopper can replace multiple chips, saving on expense saving on power consumption. NVIDIA says it uses CPU cores from NVIDIA's Grace processor and borrows some elements from the Lovelace architecture as well. Thor will be able to run Linux, QNX, and Android simultaneously to serve different parts of the car. Drive Thor will also have lower-end versions meant for driver assistance systems that don't need all that processing power that fully autonomous systems might need. It'll ship in 2024 and show up in cars in 2025, starting with China's Zeker 001 EV. And NVIDIA also gave us a look at DLSS 3, uh, the next version of its deep learning super sampling technology. That's the one that can upscale graphics and uh, allegedly quadruple performance over native resolution. It's an algorithm. Uh, it'll add bits to either increase frame rate at the same resolution or upscale the resolution without losing performance. So, for example, a game could run at 1080p, but DLSS can use machine learning to make it look like it's 4K. DLSS 3 can generate entire new frames now using the optical flow accelerator that can track and calculate on-screen object motion vectors, not just pixels. That should reduce stutter. And it'll work with NVIDIA Reflex technology to reduce latency and improve responsiveness. In a demo, they boosted Cyberpunk 2077 from less than 30 frames per second to around 100. 
uh, DLSS 2 could only get that to 60. Only the new RTX 40 series cards are going to support DLSS 3 at first because it needs the new 4th gen tensor cores and the optical flow accelerator. But there are going to be a bunch of games. They've already announced titles. More than 35 games are going to integrate support for DLSS 3 with some launching as early as October. So they'll, they'll be ready before you can get the cards that can take advantage of them. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if, if anybody here is going to plunk down for one of the new cards or not, uh, but they, they look impressive. And it looks like we're going to have pretty decent support for them out of the gate. I, I'm also, it's very impressive that they've uh, really kind of upped the ante with their uh, uh, machine learning uh, in the card because before it was like, well, are they just going to use it so people can build an array of deep learning servers based on these cards? But they have also leveraged that technology to kind of upsample images, which is great. Because I, it is going to be a key feature moving forward, just as ray tracing has been for for GPUs to integrate that. Because, I mean, it offers so many benefits um, that I I don't think you can have at least a competitive high end card without it. All right, one last NVIDIA announcement regarding large language models. Who doesn't love a large language model? Uh, let's call them LLMs for short. NVIDIA just announced its Nemo LLM service and its Bio Nemo LLM with the promise to make it easy to adapt LLMs and deploy apps for all kinds of uses. Uh, one LLM that we hear a lot about these days is GPT-3 from OpenAI. Uh, they also make Dolly. And Sarah, we have some news about Dolly today as well. Indeed we do. OpenAI is now allowing AR, AI art generator Dolly to edit images with human faces. You might recall that was previously banned due to fears of misuse. OpenAI now says the change follows improvement in the filters to remove images containing things like sexual, political, and violent content. Face images can be edited to change hair or clothing and even permit other variations. In a letter to users, Dolly said the company is also minimizing the potential of harm from deep fakes. Now, it could also be doing this because there are a lot of other text to image systems out there. Imogen, Crayon, yeah. Stable Diffusion lets you do pretty much everything you want because you run it locally. Midjourney is very popular. They all allow different, and as I mentioned, sometimes more latitude in what you create. In fact, John Herman at nymag.com has an excellent read called AI Art is Here and the world is already different. How we work, even think, changes when we can instantly command convincing images into existence. Uh, some of you have been asking about when we would get the next truly new tech advance. I think this may be one of them. Yeah, so a lot of Herman's article focuses on Midjourney because that's what he's been using. Midjourney is unique in that it doesn't have VC backing, only 10 employees, small team, but very popular. Users pay $10 to $16, uh, $600 per year for image generation, depending on what they want to do, new features, licensing rights, etc. Its Discord server has 2 million members, though. People are interested. Free users get a limited number of requests before they have to pay. Paid members get their images delivered by private message in Discord. And then the money is used to pay for the cloud servers and 10,000 or so GPUs that then process those requests. But what Herman has noticed in talking to other Midjourney users is that text to image generators are used for a lot of different reasons. Some predictable, some not so much. And it's moved out of the surprising and kind of fun, jokey phase of making a, you know, a weird image into something he calls competent and plausible. Yeah, so so here's a few examples from the articles. And Kiki, uh, you and Sarah both, I, I'd, I'd like you to think about uh, whether any of these are surprising to you or if it sparks other ideas of what people might be using these for. Uh, one example is just showing something to somebody uh, from your head. Uh, if you have an idea, you don't need to sketch it. Uh, you just describe it and Midjourney can actually make a picture of it. Uh, you could, it could be a prototype or a decorating idea, whatever. A game designer is using it to make 
between 600 and 1,000 unique pieces of art they need for a game, something they as an individual couldn't afford to hire artists to do. What they're getting is good enough for self-publishing, though, and if they get a deal with a distributor, potentially speeds up the final work from professional artists. A children's author is using it to create pictures for their book, something that would have taken them much longer in the past. They're replacing themselves by saying, well, let's get the AI to do it. Uh, a designer for the state of California is using it for pamphlets, saying it's better than the clip art that they would be forced to use otherwise without the expense of having to pay someone, which they don't have the budget for. Uh, an Australian ad agency is looking into it for broader creative options for cuts customers that don't have large budgets, especially global customers. You don't want to pay for a designer. We can do this for you. Uh, there's a design director. You might think, oh, they're the ones that are going to be mad about this. A design director is using it to make concept art that can use photography and illustrations that they wouldn't normally have time for in concept art, but it means their concepts don't look like everybody else's because they're not pulling from the same stock art that all the other design directors are pulling from. Uh, Deviant art has been flooded with a bunch of mid-journey stuff. It's it's certainly controversial in the art world. Uh, but Kiki, what do you what do you make of this? It does feel like this is expanding rapidly from something that was brand new and novel not that many months ago. Yeah, but I think it really is, it's a tool. It's an advance in the technology that allows creatives to be able to be more creative. It's not creative on its own. And I think that's the big uh, delineation there, right? That's how we get, you know, oh, humans are creative. We come up with the ideas. We're just asking this tool to help us fine tune things and to give us products that we can use. Yeah, because yeah, the creativity is I mean, in the, the prompt, Right. The right. It's just shifting the creativity. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. There was probably, you know, in the, I don't know, mid to late 90s, we all had this conversation like, well, if you're really a good photographer, why would you need Photoshop? Mm -hmm. Kind of the same conversation, right? It's like, well, why would you need this? If you're, you know, if you're, if, if you're a creative person who could generate really wonderful art on your own, this is a tool. Like you said, Kiki, this is 100% a tool. And it, we're, we're still in the early days, so we don't totally Absolutely. know how the tool is going to be used or misused. But I think if you're an artist, and I certainly am I'm a terrible artist, but I know a lot of people who are a lot better at this than me, who are pretty prompt about this, because it allows you as an artist to kind of go to the next level as far as creativity goes, based yeah. on the AI giving you that first step. I think what's so fascinating about this is when it first came out, the two big reactions, which frankly, from where I said, are usually the, the reactions to anything new, which is this is going to be misused Scary, and it's horrible hate it. yeah. or uh, this is dumb uh, and it's overhyped and it's never going to be useful. Like th those are often the two knee jerk reactions. And what we're seeing now is that neither of those is true. Well, maybe it's being misused, but certainly not at the level that people were afraid of. More often, it's being used, as we, as we all have said, as a tool. And I imagine there are people already saying this, and it's going to be more common for people to go, yeah, I thought the text to image generator might be good for this, but it was just faster for me to do it myself. Like, we'll hit that limit where we're like, oh, it's good for these things, but it's not good for those things. Totally. As someone with absolutely no artistic skill, it could I, I can tell that if I can tell a computer to draw mm -hmm. something for me, it's going to be better than me trying it myself. Yeah. It's always going to be better for me, too. <laughs> it's always going to be better. Yeah. But there are those like Scott Johnson who are going to be like, oh, no, I can do that faster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show, folks? We've got a subreddit that's full of great ideas, and yours could be among them. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. <laughs> All right, so over the past few months, we've covered several stories about brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs. How can they help patients move their limbs? How can they help patients speak again after being paralyzed due to an accident or some sort of an illness? But how do they actually work? And what happens between the electrodes of the interface and the brain? Dr. Kiki... We know you've thought a lot about this. Uh, give us a little bit of insight on what you know so far. 
Well, brain control interfaces generally are any kind of technology that takes signals from the brain and connects it to a computer. And this can be either unidirectional or bidirectional. And most often when we're hearing about these BCIs nowadays, it's with relation to these kind of hard needle-like electrode arrays that get implanted invasively into the brain. Um, and the the issues that we want to be worried about or that we want to be thinking about moving mm-hmm. forward with these kinds of electrode arrays are related to the usability, the safety, and the longevity of these devices. So currently, um, you might hear about one individual using a brain control interface to allow them to do the, go about doing daily life kind of skills and 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 things uh, because really these devices are trained individual by individual our brains are distinct enough that at this point in time we can't just have an off the shelf hey put it on top of your put it put it on your head and uh, or in your ear right. or whatever not you know, all you brains just, are alike not all brains are alike exactly our brains are soft and electrodes are generally hard so that's another technological challenge. Um, There are a few new developments that have been moving forward to make these invasive devices a little bit less invasive, so softer electrode arrays. But then you have the problem of do they actually connect with the the soft Mm -hmm. cells? Do they make contacts um, that are are long-term going to be viable to get the signal across? Some 15 to 20 percent of people don't even have brain signals that are good for being picked up by these electrode arrays, so they can't even be used by everybody. Um, And then in terms of the cool, cutting-edge kind of stuff, there is a neural dust that is being developed, which is ultrasonic in nature and would allow um, using ultrasound signals and other um, radio-based technologies to be able to pick up signals from this nano-sized dust that could be sprinkled on the surface of your uh, cortex. However, so far, it's only been uh, studied in with a, a skull open of a mouse. So if you're a person, you don't want to be walking around necessarily with your skull open to the air so that your nano dust can be nope. read by whatever device well, is being Well, but used. for anybody who, you know, and I've had some brain issues in the past, and we don't have to get into that right now, but, right. you know, for me, it's like anything that requires, like, you really got to look at the brain, you got to do MRI. So the idea that an ultrasound, a.k.a. a much less invasive version of something that could get you, you know, the results that you're looking for is, is, is remarkable. Yeah, there's another technology that's based on stents. So similar to the placement of stents that's used in uh, uh, cardiac surgery to open up um, arteries and veins going to the heart or coming from the heart. um, They're also practicing the placement of these electrode arrays within the arteries that go into the brain. So it makes it a lot easier for a relatively less invasive procedure to occur to get electrodes to the place where they can pick up a signal and be reliably used for whatever purpose is necessary. So does that Um, work like a pipe cleaner kind of where it's folded up (laughs) through the artery and then when it gets to the brain, it can can kind of open up? Right. And it would open up not enough to actually block any Uh blood flow, because as we know, blood flow to the brain is incredibly (laughs) important. Yeah. Can't, can't, can't. Don't block that. (laughs) Don't block the blood flow to the brain. So, uh, but the device is, um, has so far been very uh, successful in mouse models. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) what I'm hearing is a lot of, if you have a severe enough condition, this might be worth it. Uh, yes. If you're a mouse, you've got the cutting edge stuff. <laughs> this uh, is always the case. Mice are always on the yeah. cutting edge. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, for practical everyday use, we're still in the realm of those things that can kind of try to read things from outside your skull. Like, And those are limited. 
Right. So, and, and that's the, that's the thing. Invasive surgery is never the road you want to go down. And at this point in time, the electrodes don't last long enough Mm -hmm. to be able to, um, really last the lifetime of a person. So if you're young and you have a a disability or even you want to be a superhero and, you know, just talk telepathically to your computer, you know, having the surgery that, in which you have to place this electrode, this electrode array in your brain, um, you don't want to go through that multiple times. And there's the chance of infection. There are always problems with the placement of that electrode array. And the placement of the electrode array itself could cause neural problems. So it's not something you want to take lightly. Right. So people who are... Um, who have severe disability, uh, that's usually where it starts. And this is where the research is really starting to be helpful, successful, and have a lot of impact. And as the technologies progress, where we can have increased numbers of uh, electrodes in the arrays to make the signals more robust and more accurate, we're going to be able to read people's brains, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. a little bit more easily. But we still have to deal with the fact that our bodies don't want foreign objects put inside them and will the immune system will do what it can to get rid of whatever that is not to mention reading people's brains doesn't mean you'll understand no it doesn't it doesn't mean you'll understand it at all kiki i knew what you were thinking about me this whole time that's not what we're doing yeah so you've got the system (laughs) the system uh comp components that go into the brain and those get the signal the signal needs to be read but then you have to process it and figure out whether yeah interpretation has to be accurate and that again is on a person by person basis because our brains are different and we haven't gotten enough understanding yet to really be able to have a mass uh production of these devices that can like i said be off the shelf well Speaking of interpreting things, uh, many of you for, are familiar with Shazam. You know, you hear a song, you go, I like the song, but what is the song? You know, you hold up your phone, you get the information. Haiku Box is Shazam for bird songs. It's a four by six inch box that's about two inches thick. It's pretty small with a small microphone recording and identifying bird sounds. Weather resistant, designed to be outside, obviously. Wired reports that the company recommends keeping it out of direct sunlight, not submerging it in water. So, you know, you have to take some care. But in good conditions, you plug it in, connect to your Wi-Fi network via the Haiku Box Connect app, and then it starts recording bird audio. Then it sends those recorded sounds to servers at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which has thousands of bird song samples, and a neural net to process those. Cornell's library of birdsong recordings can tell the difference between actual bird songs and non-bird garden activities. Maybe you're watering your garden and it kind of sounded like a song, but it's not a bird. For those who aren't going to buy a haiku box, which is $399, by the way, they can install Cornell's Merlin Bird ID app, which uses a small subset of the data and an AI processor similar to what haiku box uses as well. Haiku box director, uh, creator, David Mann told Wired that the haiku box uses a modified version of that same data set. Kiki, I have to assume you love this. Oh, I love this so much. Yeah, I'm actually, I've, I've been waiting for something like this to become available. Uh, and the Merlin Bird app is amazing. And it, if you just want something on your phone and you hear a, a, bird, a bird singing, you can, in, it, it is Shazam. You have your phone, you turn on the app and you can, it, it can identify bird Same songs idea, yeah. very reliably. This is exciting because it's passive. And you don't have to always be out in your yard to go, I wonder what that bird is, and have to turn your app on. Since it's recording all these sounds, it can be like, oh, hey, this bird flew through your yard and made us through a few twerp twerps, and suddenly you know that you've got a migrant species that's passing through. And this is so exciting and interesting for people who are into bird watching and knowing the animals that are passing through your environment. Yeah, even when you're not around. It's like a, it's like logging the birds in your neighborhood. Yeah, and uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology has been on the forefront of all of this for a really long time, pushing the uh, recording of these bird songs and learning, uh, similar to like Google's learning languages and various voice uh 
voice narrative stuff. And so the, they are on the forefront of these bird song identification uh, uh, tools and are they've got such a huge library. Their data set is massive, but getting these in your library in your yard can also help them to continue to improve their library and it'll get better and better and better. All right, let's check let's out the mailbag. Yeah. This one comes from Laurent in unseasonably wet Montreal. Laurent, hope you're staying uh, dry. <laughs> Who says, the use case that you explained, um, <clears throat> pardon me, for translating content reminds me of something that Mr. Beast currently does. Laurent is, is referring to us talking on the show yesterday about um, the idea of having an avatar who maybe looks like you, sounds like you. You can give give them uh, speech and 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 they, for the most part, act as you. Laurent says, if you have a YouTube video that you would like to translate, Mr. Beast, his company, does it for you using real voice actors so you don't ha get that robotic sounding voice like many text-to-speech tools. From what I understand, says Laurent, you don't pay for the translation, but he gets 30% of the YouTube ad revenue for that video. Why use that, though? Well, he uses the same voices that people are used to hearing for movie dubbing. So, for example, a video translated to Brazilian Portuguese would use the same voice as people are used to hearing on the big screen. That might keep people listening longer than they would with AI voices. Plus, more jobs. Well, uh, sure. If you can afford to share the revenue, uh, yes, you could always pay someone to do the thing that technology could do. So that's uh, that's interesting, Laura. Thanks, thanks for passing that along. I'm sure there's always a human version. You could pay someone to make the art that we were talking about earlier. Uh, but this is an sure. interesting way to, to to monetize it in a way that might make it more accessible. Yeah, in I, a world I think it, with it more of, money. <laughs> it just it sort of it just I don't know. I guess it. Um, kind of goes to show that this sort of thing people want it maybe it would be an ai solution maybe in other times you'd want to pay for it to be a little bit more personalized but you know this is something that that people want as a service absolutely well, Kiki Sanford, we're so glad to have you, as always. Give folks uh, a sense of what you do all week when we're not hanging out with you. Oh, well, I wish I could hang out with you all much more often. It's always <laughs> such a good time. Um, what I normally do is the This Week in Science podcast. You can find us at twist.org. And the uh, Twitter for that is Twist Science. We broadcast live 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday evenings. My personal Twitter is at Dr. Kiki, D-R-K-I-K-I, and I am also working with the Association of Science Communicators to develop the professional community of science communicators, and we are currently accepting submissions for speakers for our 2023 conference, which will take place April 6th and 7th, 2023. Well, we're so glad to have you today. Um, please come back early and often. I would love to. Thank you. Uh, of course. Uh, special thanks to Jeff Stark. We sometimes just say we'd like to thank a top lifetime supporter for the show. And you know what? Jeff Stark is the person that we're thanking today. Thank you, Jeff, for all the years of support. Could be you tomorrow if you become a new patron. Could be you if you've been supporting us for a long time. This time it's Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Indeed. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you to all our patrons, speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. What will we talk about? Only the... Nobody knows. You can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 at UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we are back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>